Welcome to another edition of Integrations in the News. This is going to be the April 2022 edition. Let's get started. Okay, so to get started with this edition, we're going to be diving into big data and some of the nuances behind big data and what's going on in the industry to deal with a lot of data that's being generated nowadays, in particular, AI and machine learning. Now, this first article in particular is showing that 88% of chief data officers are now accumulating and building a process to automate their data cleansing and basically being able to tidy up and verify the veracity, the integrity of the data, as opposed to just doing the integration work. So you have different systems. We're integrating those different systems, and there are commonly these two concepts that you'll hear a lot about. There are integrations and automations. And so the automations are typically seen as kind of a separate side of the same coin. And a lot of chief data officers are really starting to see integrations and automations as the same thing, as something they need to be thinking about as in scope and in context for integration projects. And similarly for automation projects, integrations are in scope as well. Now, this is absolutely something that many companies have already been doing. Uh, but what you'll see is that basically many of the new technologies that are out there today, for example, Internet of Things is contributing to a massive influx of data, but it's data that isn't necessarily useful. And so a lot of the data is never reviewed because it's not possible to effectively analyze that data in a reasonable way. That's really where this automation comes in to cleanse the data, make sure that it's high integrity and makes sense to the organization. And in addition to that, we also have AI and machine learning. Now, if you haven't used AI and machine learning before, you may or may not be you know, familiar with how this is going to help um, and how this may be useful. Uh, but in general, it's much easier to use and much easier to set up than most people will initially think. Um, it can sound intimidating, but generally there are some very nice capabilities that don't take long to set up. Now, in addition, the concept here from the rest of this article is that uh, basically a lot of the data itself needs to be enriched and a lot of the data needs to take into account additional detailed information. So the concept is that we can leverage automation, not just integration, so that you're bringing in smart data. And whenever you're leveraging different sources of information, we can set up AI and machine learning and make it so that this data integration uh, includes automation steps to enrich the data and make it higher integrity. OK, so let's take a look at the next article now. Now, this one is going to be talking a little bit about customer experience. And basically, the idea here is that organizations that analyze all relevant data and deliver actual information will achieve an additional uh, round of productivity gains over their less analytical oriented peers. And here you can see in this article, it's, it's stating that it's going to be about $430 billion in productivity gains as this estimate goes. So regardless of the scope of that and the impact, the main thrust of this is as you're looking at your integrations, as you're looking at your automations, you want to be looking for how you can get relevant data and analyze it and inject it back into the workflows within the business. Well, this is typically the whole point of integrations and automations, uh, but this is something that whenever you get to actionable insights and actually taking it and building it into the process, in particular with opening up the data for the customer, making it visible and usable for them, and then making it so that they can have a self-service capability. Everything focused around self-service and immediacy so that they're not having to wait or go through a bureaucratic process that has manual steps. Any reduction of manual steps is absolutely imperative. And you know this can be pretty relative to your particular data, uh, excuse me, your particular industry, because depending on the industry, you may have competitors that are absolutely going to win every single time if you don't get to a certain threshold of capability that's similar or exceeding theirs. So you're going to want to analyze this not just from a what is possible perspective, but also what do we need to do to be the best within this space? 
Um, ultimately, this goes on to continue to talk about things like AI and machine learning, uh, which again, you're going to see this a lot in the space, um, in particular with being able to take the data and make intelligent choices with how to marry it with other intermediate data sources, disparate sets of information, attributes, etc. But in addition to that, you'll also start to see integrations that can be self-healing or learning or build themselves, essentially, um, in some offerings. The main point is that you're going to want to become familiar with AI and machine learning if you're not already, to the extent that you can use the knowledge that you gain to analyze some of the different competitive offerings that are out there and make sure that you're getting the most bang for the buck. Okay, so let's take a look at the next article now. This next article talks a little bit about the NHS lagging on EPR adoption, EPR for electronic patient record. And in the US, this is commonly called PHI, uh, protected healthcare information. And basically the idea is that the UK is working to bring a consistent set of data for each patient, um, each particular end user or consumer uh, within the healthcare system and within kind of the protection of GDPR, uh, they're looking to bring them online with a standard record. Now, again, you'll see this in the US as well, but the idea is that a lot of these entities and the government overall, they're looking to get this standardized while also standardizing the level of protection and security and privacy that goes along with anyone who is holding this data. Um, so long story short, if you take a look at the article, uh, basically, the core takeaway here is that putting everyone on a single instance of a single EPR, electronic patient record, will Im immediately uh, meant that they were seeing all of the exact same information for that particular patient. So there was no delay, no interoperability burden of exchanging data, and they simply understood what their colleagues were doing with their patients, uh, the shared patients, and it was at a distance, but immediate. And so this is really powerful, not just for the medical space, so definitely for the medical space, but also for the overall industry and thinking about where your industry is going with standardizing data, whether you're in the medical field or not, uh, where are you going with standardizing the information and how powerful can this be within your space? You might be surprised how relatively simple it is to get a lot of the different folks that you work with to use a standard and to take a leadership position within your space and say, look, we need to assume a standard, whether it's EDI or CXML or you know, some other format, we need to use a standard format within our space. And then we need to identify how we're going to organize this information. And whether or not you're able to do that, the other kind of takeaway that you can have is if your space won't do that, um, then you can at least identify what a best path is and communicate that and effectively organize that so that when you are working with different vendors, uh, you can maximize the potential to be effective. Again, this article is pretty interesting because they're going on to kind of talk about how essentially the more and more efficient that they can be with this patient data by normalizing and standardizing to a single record per patient, uh, the more that it benefits the end patients and it benefits the whole system by reducing cost. How amazing that a single simple record, uh, just standardizing it is one of the biggest challenges. But if you think about it, with all the security and all the interoperability challenges with different systems, it becomes a logistical nightmare just to share basic information. So very exciting to see this development in this uh, side of the industry. Okay, let's take a look at the next article now. Okay, so this one's talking a little bit about how integration and automation are often viewed as separate tasks, but they really should be seen as the same thing. So let's just dive into this briefly. It's basically saying that companies shouldn't have to buy different tools to solve their data problems, specifically integrations and automations. So you should be able to do all of this in one platform. And we've talked about this before in integrations in the news. There's a lot of development in the integration space. There's a lot of investment and you really shouldn't have to settle. You really ideally are going to be looking for a vendor that you can work with for at least the next three to five years, who's going to offer a solution that delivers everything you need and it matches your needs within your space, within your industry. Okay, so let's continue on. It says that these could be ETL, extract, transform, load, 
API, application programming interface management, or IPaaS integration platform as a service tools. So it could be any of those. Um, and on the automation side, there are BPM, business process management, and RPA, robotic process automation tools. Now, the concept here is that you've kind of got these two developing branches of automation and integration. And a lot of companies in the space are seeing that they've got to be able to offer both of these solutions and bring them together under one umbrella. And really with a cohesive presentation for the end user and a cohesive process for setting these up and executing on them and having them kind of orchestrate the integration and the automation in a way that makes sense. Uh, this is, again, just kind of like the previous news article that we looked at, a concept that's very simple in nature, but very powerful overall. Because if the systems are separate, if you have a separate integration and a separate automation, and maybe multiple different integrations and automations, you can see how this becomes cumbersome. You end up with different folks learning the different systems, and the overhead becomes dramatically higher than if it was simply under a single umbrella. Ultimately, for many businesses, this isn't necessarily possible to do right away, but this ought to be something that you're thinking about as a overall trend or a strategy for the long term to bring everything together and standardize it so that you can get the benefits of kind of consolidating it together. Okay, and then the last article that we wanted to go over here is talking about PII, and this is personally identifiable information. And basically, the amount of this data that's out there continues to grow every year. And depending on your space, this can be a liability. And ultimately, for anyone that has a web presence that's public facing in any way, you're probably going to be looking at, and frankly, you probably already are, uh, working on GDPR, CCPA, et cetera. And so some of these regulations that are already out there and regulations that have yet to come along but will, uh, are going to dictate the consequences of not doing this. So we really recommend conceptually just understanding that it makes a lot of sense to be planning around security and being able to anonymize the data. So if you take a look at this article, um, it's, it's essentially talking about what PII is and effectively what some of the different policies are that kind of regulate this space of making sure that the consumer's information is secure, uh, that it's handled properly, that it's respecting the privacy requirements, et cetera, of each particular user, and what the consequences are uh, if you don't. And this is a great diagram that just kind of shows a very high level of what all is included in uh, GDPR in this case. And ultimately, the concept here, the kind of the takeaway is data anonymization. You can also see concepts like tokenization effectively being a way to execute on this anonymization. But the idea is basically whenever you're transferring data and sending it between systems, you can tokenize the data first. So you can represent data itself as a token. And then if there is any kind of a breach or a lapse in security or any kind of an issue, uh, there really is no actual sensitive data that is shared with that token. It has to be then kind of authorized and authenticated uh, against the holder of that sensitive data. So that's one way to anonymize the information. There are a lot of different ways to do this. That's probably one of the most popular though is to tokenize. And so what we want you to take away from this is basically this is going to continue to be something that different jurisdictions, for example, the EU or different you know, states in the US, for example, like California, uh, they're going to be continuing to apply these rules to make sure that consumers are protected. This isn't going away anytime soon, so it makes sense to plan for and strategize around some of the security. It doesn't mean that you have to drop everything and focus on it exclusively, but we want to encourage you to be thinking about it, especially as you evaluate your upcoming integration strategy and how you're going to potentially feather this into that strategy. Okay, well, thank you guys for watching. We hope that this was a very helpful video. If you would, hit the like and subscribe, and we will look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.